All right, let's talk about macroeconomic analysis. So in this section, I'm going to break down my discussion of macro analysis into two parts. In this first video, I'm going to discuss the question, why do we analyze macroeconomic conditions? And then in a follow up video, I'm going to address the question, how do we assess economic growth? So how do we forecast GDP growth? And then how do we assess market risk premia? So let's get started. Now to address the question of why do we use macroeconomic analysis, I thought I'd first start off by discussing how value is created for a firm. And then I'll jump in and talk about the conditions necessary for economic growth. I'll follow that up by showing you the relationship between macroeconomic growth and market returns. And then finally, I'll discuss the importance of identifying leading macroeconomic indicators. So why do we use macroeconomic analysis? Why not simply focus on the firm's characteristics or simple technical analysis? Well, the answer is that a firm's intrinsic value or underlying value should be the present value of its expected discounted cash flows. Those cash flows depend on macroeconomic conditions as well as industry conditions and the firm's position in the industries where it operates. If macroeconomic conditions change, a firm or an industry's ability to generate profits could increase or diminish. So we need to understand both current and possible future macroeconomic conditions in any market that could impact a firm's cash flows. Macroeconomic factors include unemployment, consumer spending, interest rates, producer sentiment, and many other factors. Some of these factors will have a greater impact on the firm's intrinsic value than others. To further illustrate this point, let's take a look at the formula for intrinsic value. When we have the data to do so, we often model intrinsic value as the present value of an asset's discounted cash flows. We want to forecast cash flows that the investor will receive in each year in the future and discount those cash flows by some discount rate. What this implies is that the determinants of intrinsic value are those that affect cash flows, discount rates, and the volatility of both. The reason we care about the volatility or risk of the cash flows and the discount rate is because these values are not certain. We can make an educated guess, but if we're uncertain about a stock's future cash flows in the next few years, we might reduce the intrinsic value to account for this cash flow uncertainty. Now, cash flow and interest rate uncertainty are big problems in many countries. A couple of years ago, I was giving a seminar on merger valuation to some Brazilian executives, and I mentioned this particular discounted cash flows model. One executive spoke up and mentioned that because of the uncertain macroeconomic conditions in the country of Brazil at the time, many executives didn't bother trying to value cash flows after about years two or three in the future. In a case like that, Models like market multiples are arguably more appropriate. But my point is that macroeconomic uncertainty can have a significant impact on a firm's ability to generate cash flow for its shareholders. Now the process we're going to use when analyzing securities is called the top-down approach to investing. It has three stages, macroeconomic analysis, industry analysis, and security analysis. We start with macroeconomic analysis. In this step, you analyze macroeconomic conditions to determine the outlook for investors in various asset classes in various markets. The goal is to get a sense of what economies and asset classes in those economies are most likely to be worthwhile from an investment standpoint. This involves a lot of data collection, reading, and listening. This is arguably the most difficult part of the process since even our best models perform relatively poorly. I'll show you some of those results in a bit. The second step is industry analysis. In industry analysis, we identify the conditions in each industry or sector of a market to determine whether we should overweight or underweight some industries. Different industries offer different opportunities or challenges. Some industries, like the brick and mortar clothing retail industry, have been declining for years, so we might reasonably underweight that industry if we think conditions leading to that decline will continue. Finally, we have security analysis. In security analysis, we identify the individual stocks in each industry that are most likely to outperform. We use fundamental analysis and valuation techniques to determine whether an asset's intrinsic value is greater than its market value. If it is, then we would want to buy that stock. 
Now let's take a look at arguably the most important indicator of macroeconomic conditions, GDP growth. I've collected data from the IMF's website. You can learn a lot about a country's economy by looking at the year-over-year -year change in GDP, since it represents the total value of all finished goods and services produced in the country. Let's start with Mongolia. Notice that in 2014, the country had a GDP growth rate of 7.9%. In the period from 2010 to 2014, the Mongolian economy averaged an 11.28% GDP growth rate due largely to the rapid increase in mining activity. However, because this growth was export-based, it was sensitive to changes in the mining industry and commodity prices. When demand from China declined, Mongolia's mining sector experienced a slowdown. Thus, we see a decrease in real GDP growth after 2014. Now, let's take a look at Ethiopia. Notice the very high GDP growth rate here, all the way through our sample period. Ethiopia is arguably one of the fastest growing countries in Africa. The country has a large percentage of very young people who are entering the labor force. Historically, the country had many state-owned firms, but many of these are being privatized. The country is resource-rich, and its government has implemented many policies to attract foreign direct investment. Assuming these underlying conditions don't change, we might reasonably expect the country to continue to offer a high GDP growth rate. Other countries, like Libya, have extremely volatile GDP growth. As an investor, this is something that I would really want to avoid. Libya has been embroiled in a civil war since the Arab Spring in 2011. It's unclear how it will be resolved, but the high volatility in the GDP growth rate means that there's likely a large degree of turmoil in the country. As a risk-averse investor who only wants to invest in countries with a good rule of law and property rights, I would avoid investments here. Now the final thing I want to point out here is the GDP growth in 2020 for most of these countries. It's negative, and obviously this is due to the COVID-19 outbreak that started in a lot of countries early in 2020. Obviously, most countries around the world saw negative GDP growth, but even during the 2020 outbreak, countries like Ethiopia still posted a positive GDP growth rate, which is actually pretty incredible. Now, before we go any further, I should mention that the CFA Institute has identified six conditions necessary for economic growth. If a market does not meet these conditions, it's likely a very risky country for investment and likely could see negative GDP growth. So I want to go through these conditions and talk about each of them in turn. Uh, the first and most basic conditions required for economic growth are political stability, the rule of law, and property rights. These ensure that your investment won't be nationalized or seized by the government. In countries with poor political stability, a new government could introduce new laws that reduce the value of your investment. In countries with a poor rule of law, Different rules exist for different people depending on who they are and who they're connected to. In countries with poor property rights, your assets are more likely to be seized with, without due recourse. The next condition we need to consider is whether savings and investment are possible. If there's nowhere to invest, then your ability to receive a return on your investment is obviously not going to be relevant. We also want to ensure that financial markets and intermediaries exist. Financial markets and intermediaries like banks allow us to raise local capital and sell our stake in an investment if we decide to exit the position. The presence of financial markets and intermediaries also help to increase local liquidity and allow for the movement of capital from providers to users of capital that can offer a good return. Next, we want to ensure investments in human capital are being made if we're investing in the long term. Investments in human capital can be in the form of education, healthcare, and other social services that benefit individuals. If an economy has a poor educational system, it's unlikely there's a large pool of local workers that possess the skills necessary for highly skilled or even low-skilled jobs. We also want to make sure there are regulatory systems in place. If we're investing in a firm in an economy without regulations, other competitors could steal intellectual property or undercut our firm's prices by using cheaper, more dangerous inputs for their products. Finally, we would prefer to invest in countries with free trade and unrestricted capital flows. 
If a country has capital controls, which prevent people from moving cash out of the country, this might not be a good investment for us. Capital controls are often used to ensure that there's a large supply of capital in a country, which can help drive down the cost of capital for companies and the interest rate on government debt of that country. If those capital controls are reduced, then we should expect to see capital flight from the country to other countries. If you've looked at an economy and determined that it has the necessary conditions for economic growth, then it's time to determine the current stage of the business cycle. The business cycle refers to the pattern from recession to recovery to recession again. During expansionary periods, when GDP growth is positive, cyclical industries tend to perform quite well. However, during recessionary, also known as contractionary, periods, investors flee to safety and low-risk assets. So let's take a look at a brief breakdown of various assets' performance depending on the stage of the business cycle. During expansionary periods, growth stocks have historically outperformed value stocks. Remember that we define growth stocks as stocks with high market-to-book ratios and value stocks as stocks with low market-to-book ratios. During recessionary periods, when GDP growth turns negative, investors tend to sell their shares of growth stocks and use that capital to buy bonds or shares of less risky value stocks, thus causing those assets to outperform. Historically, bonds underperform stocks during most time periods. However, during recessionary periods, bonds tend to outperform stocks, since there tends to be a sell-off in the equity market. Historically, stocks with high betas outperform stocks with low betas during expansionary periods, since cash flows of high beta stocks are cyclical in nature and grow when investors have disposable income. Examples of high beta stocks are airlines, travel companies, auto manufacturers, and real estate developers. During recessionary periods, few people are traveling and buying durable goods like cars and houses, so these high beta stocks underperform. Finally, the tech sector tends to outperform during expansionary periods since many valuations in this industry are based on investor expectations of growth. As investor expectations of future growth fall during recessionary periods, these tech stocks tend to underperform the equity of firms with more stable cash flows. Now, where should you start your analysis of the business cycle and macroeconomic conditions? Well, the statistics you're looking at right now are some of the first data points we normally want to collect. In the U.S., various government agencies or organizations compile these. If you have access to a Bloomberg terminal, you can collect all of them using the ECST, or Economic Statistics function. The statistics you see here should give you a sense of current conditions as far as the size of the economy, consumer confidence, the number of people looking for work, inflation, and fiscal and monetary policy. If you click on any of the links in the PowerPoint, they'll take you to the Fed's FRED database, which compiles all of these statistics from various organizations. The problem is that these variables, the ones I just listed, don't always predict future growth. Most of the indicators I just showed you are what we call lagging or coincident indicators. This indicates that the value of these statistics indicates either past or current conditions. These statistics are good for identifying where the economy has been and where it is now. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so what I have here is a set of some data series. I have the change in GDP for a series of countries, and then I have the return of the broadest market index in each of these countries. Uh, so these are contemporaneous. So the change in GDP of uh, for 20... 14, I believe, and then the return in Kenya in their broadest market index during 2014. And then I'll talk about this one in a second. But what I do is I run a regression where I regress the returns of these indexes on the change in GDP. And what you, what you should notice here is that we do see that there is some explanatory power here. So essentially... The change in GDP does help explain a portion of the asset returns or the equity returns uh, in the, give it, in the give, given country in the given year. And if I look at the coefficient on the change in GDP, what we see is a positive relationship. So when 
the market expands, or rather when the economy expands in that country, we tend to see more positive returns in that country. Uh, it's significant, uh, admittedly only at the 10% level here, but that's because I'm using a very small data set, I think. If I were to increase the sample size, I think that would dramatically increase. Uh, notice here that uh, what I have is a plot of the relationship between uh, the change in GDP and contemporary contemporaneous returns. So we have the actual returns, and then uh, we also have the predicted returns based on the change in GDP in a given year. So you can definitely notice a, a positive trend in the, the actual returns, the blue dots, but it's, it's not as linear as we would like to see. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to show you. Now, I also ran a regression where I regressed future returns. So the returns in the year after we analyzed GDP growth. So that's what this column is. It's the returns in the next year, year T plus one. So I regress this column on the change in GDP in year T. And notice here that we don't actually see statistical significance in the relationship between the change in GDP and the uh, returns of the broadest market index in that period. So we have even a, a negative coefficient, a negative coefficient on the GDP change variable. Uh, like I said, it's not statistically significant even at the 10% level. What this indicates, and admittedly, uh, I should, should have used more data than I did. I only had 34 observations in this, but uh, what this indicates is that we do see a contemporaneous relationship between GDP growth and market returns, but we don't st see a statistically significant relationship between GDP growth and future returns, or the returns of the market in that country in the next year. So that's the big takeaway of this. It's that GDP growth is a contemporaneous variable. It doesn't predict future conditions or future market returns. If we want to get a sense of where the economy is headed, we ideally want to identify the value of leading indicators. Now, leading indicators tend to change before movements in the broader market. Thus, they give us a sense of what could happen. Factors like the leading economic index, producer sentiment, aggregate short activity, and forecasted values of economic statistics are all seen as leading indicators. And in the next video, we'll talk about these in more detail. Now, collecting data from coincident and leading indicators should help you identify current and possible future economic conditions. We use this information to determine how to allocate capital to each asset class and market. If leading indicators indicate positive information, we're likely to want to take long positions or increase the market exposure in those markets with good leading indicators. If our leading indicators indicate possible headwinds, we might want to consider reducing our exposure to the market. There are a few problems with simply creating a trading rule based on leading indicators, though. A few statistics might not tell us the full story, and some leading indicators might indicate positive conditions ahead, while others might indicate uh, strong headwinds or negative conditions ahead. This is why investors should pull data from many different resources and read everything they can to get a better understanding of the factors driving those statistics. Okay, so let's summarize. Macroeconomic analysis allows us to forecast the conditions in the environments where a firm operates. We have a series of coincident, lagging, and leading indicators, and the ones that are most important to us as portfolio managers or analysts it are leading indicators because they tell us where the market is likely headed. Uh, we also know that there's a positive relationship between economic growth and stock returns. However, that is a coincident or contemporaneous relationship. And finally, the market exposure of a portfolio should depend on expected future macroeconomic conditions. So with that, I'm going to conclude, and I hope to see you on the next video. Thank you.